I guess it is time to start. Uh, let me introduce myself first of all. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Vlahogiannis. I'm the first Vice President of the Thessaloniki Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I welcome all of you here in this uh, afternoon uh, for this very, very interesting uh, meeting we have with uh, uh, Mr. Patrick Faniel, Managing Director of uh, Management Center of Europe. Uh, this uh, event is co-organized with um, the Association of um, um, Business Administration Northern Greece. Is that correct, Mr. Edeve? It's okay, Northern Management Greece. Association. Okay. Management Association, okay. Um, and we will have a very interesting topic about uh, leadership. Uh, leadership matters in these times. I mean, leadership is very important, especially um, in the period we are living, in a period we have uh, very beautiful names to describe it, like permacrisis, uh, like VUCA, volatile uncertainty, uh, complexity, ambiguity. Certainly at uh, um, a time uh, that poses uh, to managers and to businessmen and uh, all for everyone uh, a serious uh, challenge how to navigate in this uh, environment, in this um, very complex environment uh, that uh, will be more complex in the future, I, I can promise it. Uh, simpler can, can, can't uh, be. Um, and that is uh, the reason I reacted immediately when I received a couple of weeks ago a, ma a mail from uh, uh, Mr. Tafaniel that he, was, uh, he will visit Thessaloniki and uh, he offered himself to organize, to, to, to make a lecture about leadership here at the Promise of the Chamber. We, uh, as I said, we reacted immediately and uh, that is our, our pleasure to, to do that. Uh, I give the floor to Mr. Egyptiadis now, the President of the Board of Directors of EDV, for his um, introductory remark. Thank you very much uh, once again for being here, and of course, thank you, Mr. Faniel, for uh, your presence here in Thessaloniki, and uh, we will have certainly a very interesting uh, afternoon. Good afternoon from me also. Uh, let me introduce myself again, although I have been already introduced by Mr. Lachoyanis. My name is Apostolos Egyptiadis, and uh, almost four years ago, we had the audacity to recreate the Management Association in Greece. And we called it the Northern Greece Management Association. It has become rather successful uh, until now, and we are hoping it will be better in the years to come. Well, let me re read some things that I have prepared. Uh, well, dear guests, friends, and members of the Northern Greece Management Association, I would like to express my appreciation to the Thessaloniki Chamber of Commerce and Industry for organizing this promising event, and to my friends, the Vice President, Mr. Vlachoyanis, and Mr. Axilithiotis, for inviting our association to participate as a supporter. Management Center Europe has been for many years a pivotal organization for management training in our continent. On the other hand, Northern Greece Management Association is the only organization in our region having, as, meaning Northern, uh, Northern Greece, having as a sole statutory purpose the advancement of awareness and training in the field of business management. Before giving the floor to our prestigious keynote speaker, Mr. Patrick Faniel, kindly allow me to try to approach the idea of modern leadership using words of diachronic and international value inherited by our Greek ancestors. Leadership is a talent, but also a character. It employs energy, enthusiasm, fantasy, but also logic. It needs system, program, strategy, and tactics, but also ethics. Through dialogue and synergy, it creates harmony. It combines ancient ideas of theory and practice to create symmetry and rhythm, and finally, triumph. Thank you very much. 
Σας ευχαριστώ. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kipiadis. If one is thinking about matchmaking, that is uh, our, our privileged task to uh, um, support all, all uh, networking uh, events. And uh, if, it is, uh, if it comes to matchmaking, that's very good for, uh, for the chamber. It's very good for the region. Thank you in advance. So I give now the floor to Mr. Faniel. Uh, yes. So I will use uh, this, this micro, uh, that will be easier, so I can also uh, uh, stand out. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Chamber of Commerce and to Management Association to uh, have accepted to uh, uh, have me here. Uh, it was indeed short notice, but I really appreciate that uh, uh, you are welcoming me like this. Many thanks. And uh, to you too, to take some time of your busy schedule to uh, speak about leadership because leadership has changed a lot those last uh, years. I would say five years, six years. Uh, why is that? We will uh, discuss that a little bit later today. Uh, but indeed, uh, it's not about uh, style anymore. It's much more complex. So what I suggest is that we follow this agenda. So I will just go back a few minutes on what has changed in our world with the impact on uh, the leaders' challenges. And to see here, I will ask you, of course, if you agree with those things or if you have other challenges that uh, are not listed in uh, what we've identified, before going into the concept of the drivers. That's the title of the book also, what leadership is for. Leadership, yes, but what for? And then we will go on how to focus and create the impact or to outperform. And I will take an example in the airline industry because it's easy and everybody knows the brands in, uh, in the airline. So I will use a couple of airlines to show you, to illustrate what, uh, what we are speaking here. And then we can, of course, have a discussion, comments or questions uh, at the end of the, of the session. So uh, let's first start with what has changed in our world. Uh, I won't come back on the COVID uh, time, I won't come back on the war, on uh, all the technology changes that we've been faced through those recent years. But all those events had a huge impact on the way people behave. And that's our point, because leadership is about leading people and their behavior to make sure that they are aligned on what we want to achieve in our organization, in our, uh, in our uh, companies. All of those things had a huge impact on that. Let's just take one. Before COVID, hybrid work, what was that? Telework, what was that? And now, in many countries, organizations are struggling in getting back the people back to work. They prefer to stay home and to work from home. It's not just about leading people from home, it's also the fact that you have some people being at the office. And what do they think? Oh, my colleagues are home in their pajamas and I'm sitting at the office, I do the effort. This is the type of things that leaders have now to take into account. And you cannot solve that by just having a leader uh, style that is adapted. That doesn't work anymore the stuff is much more complex. If I'm asking you, what do you feel are the most important challenges for leaders today? What would you say? Anybody has ideas on that? But Hello, thank you. Many generations in one organization. That's a very good one, yes. Other challenges? If you don't have any challenges, that's great too, huh? AI? Yes. Communication in between all the members. Yes. Good communication, kind communication. Indeed. Any other idea? Not being able to understand the lead and the lag measures. Yes, also. Uh, environment like crypto is the new era, 
Yes. Some countries has no uh, physical uh, coins like uh, Australia, digital uh, mm -hmm. uh, economy and so on. That's true. But let me show you what most of the time the challenges are. I think I need to be closer to change. Hybrid teams, one of the top ones. So people working from home, people working virtually from different countries, uh, and people being at the office. The Generation Z, the new generation, not because they are different, but because they behave different, differently, and because it's very complex to partner with them in an organization when you have the other generation. How do you react when somebody from Generation Z tells you, your manager, your leader, Oh, to learn, why? I just have to Google and to see, and I don't need to learn. I can have access to information immediately. And then uh, for you who have been uh, 10 years at the university accumulating knowledge, uh, what is this? Taking notes, why? There are systems taking notes for me. How do you lead a company when you are faced to that kind of behavior? Digitalization, everything becomes digital. So that's a big challenge also for leaders. AI, wow. We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, but probably you heard two days ago what OpenAI said. They are now able to clone the voice. What is the next step? Again, it's not just about the AI and the technology in itself. It's about the impact and the effect that will have on the people and you having to manage people and to manage organization, what kind of changes will you be obliged to do yourself to make sure that you can continue to perform? That's the question. Huh? Disruptive competition. Anything can happen anytime to your business. That could destroy completely your model in one or two days because of the technology, because of a new idea, but mainly because of the technology. Think to all what happened in the past. It took a couple of years for Kodak, one of the biggest companies in the world, to disappear because of the digitalization of the picture. Okay, that's an example. But today, every day, you have that kind of destructive change in any kind of businesses. Think to the people who were coming back to the virtual stuff that we've been obliged to do through the COVID, thanks to all the businesses that were created thanks to that and to the business that were destroyed because of that. Anything can happen to any kind of business. Like, believe me, pharma, industries, food industry. The crisis, what's next? <laughs> we've been... Uh, through a couple of things recently. Okay, what is the next one? And when? Tomorrow? In one week? In one year? We don't know. So how do you, again, adapt your business and your leadership face to such an uncertainty? The technology we spoke about, it goes so fast. And it's not now about the speed anymore. It's the acceleration of the changes. That's what is complicated. The sustainability and SCG expectation from all over the place. The immediate opportunities. We don't have the time anymore to do plans for three years, five years, and to prepare everybody to do that. No, that doesn't work anymore. The opportunity is there. If you don't take it, the neighbor will take it. And so, as I say, the accelerated changes. All of this create an environment around us, around the managers, around the companies, around the organization that creates a completely uncertain tomorrow. You don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. So how do you manage in that case? How do you lead? If uh, I take an official survey, those are the five most important challenges that are identified by Gartner and a famous company. First, effectiveness, change management, employee experience, recruiting, and future of work. When I say employee experience, I will take that as an example later to show you how this can, can influence the rest. 
but this is an important one. Employee experience in parallel to the customer experience. That's the same, uh, the same idea. So how do we cope? Ah, but we can, uh, the recipes, uh, everybody will tell you, oh, you have to be agile, you have to share and learn, you have to be proactive, you have to be open, you have to be prepared to everything, you have to be fast, and you have to analyze data. Uh, okay, that's nice, but how do you do that really concretely? How do you get people to be open? How do you get people to be creative and reactive? Alors, they will tell you, oh, there are many possible solutions. You have to create uh, project teams. You have to uh, leverage cloud computing and increase collaboration partnerships and so and so. Okay, those concepts are great again, but how do you concretely do that as a leader? This will influence completely the way you work if you know what is the starting point. And the concept we propose is a focused leadership. Leadership is too complex nowadays because you have to take care of plenty of different things. You cannot ignore them. There are too many things. Uh, the innovation, uh, the technology, the people, the customers. A leader cannot today, because of the complexity, take care of everything the same way. It's not possible. So, we have to focus, and that's the concept of the drivers. What are the drivers of your organization? What drives your leadership? Multiple areas, if you pursue a little bit of everything, you will fail in everything. That will divide your attention within the company. And if you look today, if you observe today, the top of organizations, the top NGOs, the top structures, you can clearly identify what they are about, and everybody in the company knows perfectly what the company or the organization is about. And that's because the leadership has been extremely good in cascading down the initial drivers. And that's the concept that we I have to get a little bit closer. Ah, here it is. That's the concept we will have today. It's how, after defining the right drivers, how do we cascade that down to the company to make sure that there is an alignment. Hello. I will show you the model. I will show you the drivers, the potential drivers, but the choice that the leaders and managers do will depend on their environment, on their history, on their marketplace, on their competition. There is no good choice or bad choice. What is different is when the choice is done, the recipe to cascade that down into the organization is different. Depending on the drivers, that's where the difference will be, when you cascade that down. So let me show you the model. 12 potential drivers split in four quadrants. One in business, one in people, one in customers, and one in processes. And you will see, for example, in the business, you can have companies focusing on growth, growth. You can have companies focusing on partnerships or you can have companies focusing on innovation. For the processes, so that's more internal focus, digital impact, efficiency, execution. Customer can be customer focus, can be the brand or a very personalized service or at least you give the feeling to the clients that what you offer them is a very personalized, personalized service, even if it's not true, but behind your back, of course, you have a factory, but for the clients, you give the feeling that it's, you are unique, you are a unique customer. And then for the people, you have companies having chosen the employee experience as a driver, diversity and inclusion, or the inspiration, the, inspire, the inspiring leaders. What does that all mean? 
If you think to a company like Porsche, Porsche is clearly about first the brand. It's not about the techniques of the car. If you want the best car technically, the experts will tell you, oh, it's uh, Lexus, technically. But Porsche is first about the, about the brand, sorry. Everybody at Porsche knows that the brand is extremely important and everything is focused in that direction. If you take um, innovation, for example, a company that is focusing everything on innovation is Samsung. Samsung is a very innovative company in, in, in that terms. Everything in the company is targeted towards the innovation. Digitalization. We were speaking about banks a little bit earlier today. We have some banks who clearly want to become digital banks. ING, ING is present in, in Greece. If you look at everything ING is doing for the moment, it's about digitalization. They want a digital impact. Does that mean that they don't care about the rest? No, they have to take care about the employees, they have to take care about uh, uh, their efficiency and so, but the focus is on digitalization. And then, of course, the leaders and the managers are implementing recipe to go that direction throughout the company. Um, this is valid in any kind of business, in the pharma business, in the banks, as I said, in the airline industry, in the food industry. Uh, we will take an example with the airline, as I explained. Uh, I spoke about ING, but in the pharma industry, it's exactly the same. How do you compete in the pharma industry if you are attacked by generics? Three possibilities. Let's imagine that you produce, and it's an example that we had to deal with years ago with a company called Capsugel, but uh, how do you compete if generics are attacking your market with a price 50% down of what you offer? And by the way, this is not only a pharma problem, but it could be a olive oil problem, it could be a a problem in many industries, in the industrial pump or whatever. How do you compete? You can try to compete on price. <laughs> Good luck, because you have to adapt your organization completely to make sure that everything is driven by price or cost saving. That's another type of leadership than what you've been accustomed to. So you have to adapt completely your leadership techniques to make sure that this is the focus. You have to review the reward system. If you reward people on volume, that has no sense. You have to reward people on cost savings. You have to reward people if they find ways to even go down on costs. Second possibility, you compete on value. I don't know, the, the pills become blue when they are obsolete. Then you have to create an innovation culture. That's another story. Or you create such an intimacy with your clients that price is not a, uh, a question anymore. And this intimacy, it's about a very close partnership with your clients, designing uh, the products based on their needs. And this is valid for any kind of products. And in that case, price is not the issue. So you compete versus the generics into that. So for those three cases, leadership is completely different. Does that make sense? Let's go, as I said, into an example. A concrete example with uh, the employee experience. Uh, why do I take this one? Because it is proven that if the employee experience is fantastic, it has a major impact on plenty of other aspects in your company. The customers will be more satisfied, you will, you will have uh, less issues to recruit talents, people will be more loyal, and so on, and so on. And so. Uh, people will be more creative because they are happier, and so on. And for this, I will need to take a parallel with the customer experience. So, for a customer experience, what do you expect? 
to create, you want more loyalty, you want emotions, because you know that if the customers are emotionally linked to you, that will be better for the future. So emotion is key in any kind of business again. You want to create a positive word of mouth, and you want the feeling of uniqueness. If you can create that feeling for your customers, ah, you feel good eh? if you are unique for your supplier, that's great. Alors, to show you what an airline company did to demonstrate what they wanted to do in that, re in that uh, respect, so to create emotion, let me show you two advertisements. I think I have to launch that from the computer. Would you agree with me that this is creating emotion? Would you agree with me that the employees seeing that know perfectly what they have to do? Of course, they are not going to run on the track, but does that show the importance of the client to the employees? Because it's not just a ladder, it's also internally very important. Let me show you a second one. A little bit later. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Here you are. Have a nice flight. Thank you. Okay, go, go, go. Yeah, I found them. I found them. They are the A64. Mr. Smith Jr., can you look outside, please? There's a surprise for you. second video, you've probably seen also the diversity, which is also a message for their people and for the people they try to recruit. The pilot is a woman, the driver is, so you see, yeah? so this is, most of the time, those kind of things are also important for the uh, employees and not just for the clients. So now we've spoken about the emotion, let's speak about the employee experience. What is the employee experience? At the end of the day, it's everything from the early start, even before the recruitment, when you start to communicate to attract people, to the end, retirement, or sometimes when you have to phase out some people. If you define clearly at each touch point what you want, this will oblige you 
to lead your company, your managers, and your uh, supervisors, cascading that down, very specific behavior of management. You can have different type of things, huh? but if, for example, you decide to recruit only digitally, without any human interaction, but don't expect, of course, to have a fantastic employee experience. I'm not sure that you want to be recruited by a machine. Some companies have decided to do that. You probably heard that in China, you have the first company managed by a virtual intelligence woman. So it's not somebody, it's a machine with 2,000 employees, and you perhaps know also that one of the first insurance companies in China recruiting thousands of people every year has decided to do the recruitment only based on artificial intelligence. They've identified the behavior they wanted with data, and the system is analyzing your profile, your behavior versus that performance uh, criteria, you pass, great, you fail, by a machine. The link with customers, as I said, is key for the employee experience. Um, I have here two quotes, but uh, I will only take the second one by Harvard. Um, when people are happy in your company, when you've done the right things with them, that will have a direct impact on your customers, and your performance will be higher than the others. What are the touch points? But it depends a little bit uh, company by company, but most of the time you have the onboarding, you have the collaboration, you have the promotion, what happens if you have an event in your life, a baby, a wedding, uh, those kind of things. How do you react if somebody has difficulties? Uh, how do you transfer the knowledge, mentoring programs, those kind of things? How do you do the retirement uh, situation? You have companies where to keep the knowledge in the company, they use the retired people to mentor the new ones. For a while, I have a part-time or whatever, but at least the knowledge is not lost those kind of things. And so, for each of the boxes, you define what you want. What kind of experience do you really want to create when attracting talents and convincing them? And then, leadership is about making sure that this is translated throughout the company, at any single level. And so, being a new employee, but you feel it because you experience it, and then when you have to do it yourself, you will replicate. So that's a different leadership than leadership concentrating on customers, for example. It's different. It's not good or bad. It's different. The recipe is different. Same for the promotion. How do you promote people? If it's not clear in the company, well, and it's, if it's very clear, if it's very fair, people will feel better. Again, it obliges you as a leader, as a manager, to make sure that anybody has the same behavior within the company to implement, to, in, to execute, I would say, the same way. If you have plenty different ways to deal with people in a company, that won't work. And that's leadership, is to make sure that you cascade down what you want. This is uh, very important. If we speak about the employee experience, People, employees, nowadays, are demanding the kind of experiences they get in their customer life, in their work life. And that's why some companies have a lot of difficulties to keep their talents and to recruit people because they are not known for that. And others, people would die to work for. I'm sure you know a couple of brands like that. Why don't we go now into get even closer? Yes. Into the airline business, as I said. With the concept I explained with the drivers, I 
ideally, you should not look at companies as before. Because you will, if you manage, if you master the, the 12 different areas, you will immediately identify some. So I took the airline because it's easy. Let's take one, Emirates. Everybody knows Emirates? Who flew with Emirates before? One, two. But you have an idea of what Emirates is, right? Because of the advertisement, because of the communication. And so. Emirates is about a couple of things. But clearly what they are very, very good at is first the brand. The brand is key for them. You cannot do whatever you want with the brand. Emirates is very, very strong at the brand. And second, at the people. If you are in the airline industry, your dream is to work for Emirates. That's the ultimate goal. Because they deal extremely well with their people. And what they also do, they empower their people. If you have any issue, whatever class you are, economy, business first, or super first, that doesn't matter. If you have one problem with Emirates, the people are empowered to try to satisfy you and to, make, to find a solution. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter because they want only satisfied client. That's really important to them. Diversity and belongings, that's what they officially published. Let's take another one. Saudi Arabia. Uh, in, uh, I think in February or March, Saudi Arabia launched a brand new uh, airline. Name is Hayat Air. Objective, become one of the best airlines in the world. Like Emirates, like uh, Qatar Airways, and so to win uh, all the rewards and prize and everything. They've put millions and millions in that. They recruited the best people from the different airlines, Etihad and others. Is that like Emirates? No. Look at the message of the CEO. They want to be a digital company. So digitalization, digital impact is key for them. They want to be extremely innovative. That's the second drivers for them. And of course, they want a fantastic customer experience. You have the three drivers. What more? Huh? And everybody in the company will be led with those three drivers behind the scene. Everything the managers and the leaders will do will go into those directions. Don't come with ideas to do something else because what is focusing, what they are focusing on is this. And if they manage this, they will be extremely good in their performance. Let's take another example. Ryanair. Do you know them? Who flew with Ryanair? Oh, plenty. Okay, so I have to be careful what I say then. But Ryanair, you know, is one of the most performing companies in, in Europe in terms of profit. In terms of profit, you can check. They do a, a profit that nobody else can achieve. Do they concentrate on their people, on their employees? Uh, they have strikes all over the place. They have a court case, social court case all over the place. Wow. Do they focus on customers? Do you feel nice in the plane? Uh, yeah. If something happens, do they inform you uh, about what is going to happen? Or do they leave you uh, hundreds of people, uh, passengers in, in airports? Have you seen what they are considering now in terms of uh, new seats? Why do we sit in a plane? We could do that just standing. That's the new seats. So what are the drivers? of Ryanair to be so good. First, operational efficiency. Everybody knows in the organization that they have to be extremely good at the operation. Uh, the planes have to stay in the sky, not on track. Everything is regulated. Everything is very clear. And they, they have been extremely good at cascading that down through the organization. Another one, which is not so common, it's leadership for inspiration. Who is the boss of uh, Ryanair? Michael O'Leary, do you know him? He is everywhere. 
Everybody knows what he wants, the best that he's creating. Everything he does, it's to make sure that everybody knows in the company what. So the story is fully around Michael O'Leary. Uh, who is the CEO of Air? Who is the CEO of Lufthansa? Who is the CEO of Emirates? Ever heard about them? Richard Branson? You know them? You know him? Richard Branson, Virgin? Those people have the charisma to inspire. Okay, how do you cascade down the inspiration without, within a company? I will give you a trick to identify those things. When they do a sales call, so at the a sales call, a, a sales uh, discussion and so, you have always in the history the founder or the CEO. Always. In Belgium, there is a company called Alan, Alan Healthcare. It's a relatively new company created by uh, Mr. Samuel Lyon, he's a French guy, uh, who was also very creative in the airline industry because he created some uh, seats. He had an innovation to uh, decrease the, the weight of the seats of the airlines, of the planes, by 50 or 60 percent. And a couple of years ago, he created a new uh, healthcare insurance company in France first, and then they develop step by step, country by country. Alors, in Belgium, I don't know if the system is the same in Greece, but you go to the doctor, you get, uh, uh, by you pay, <laughs> you get a document, then you send the document to the mutuelle, and if you are lucky, you send the document to a healthcare insurance company, and after a couple of weeks, sometimes calls, you will get an additional part of uh, the bill. Alan wants to be digitally excellent, they want to be customer oriented, and they want also to be inspirational. So call when they get into companies to sell this group insurance. Of course, we get all the story about Mr. Samuel Lyon. By the way, in the book, you will have his interview. What they do, it's an app on your phone, you go to the doctor, you get the document, you pay the doctor, you get the document, you take a picture, you send that to Alan, the same day you have the money on your account. Alors, when it's five euro, that's okay, that's great. But when you go to the hospital, and then you have, you have a major surgery, and we had one in our company, a guy came to, to thank us because of this health insurance, that cost a lot of money, thousands of euros. He was reimbursed the same day. 6,000 euros reimbursed because of that. I don't know how they do, but what I know is that they are very efficient, they are very profitable, and in addition to that, thanks to the app, you have access to a doctor whenever you want, chatting, you have psychologists, you have plenty of people who are at your disposal also to keep you uh, in better um, health, giving you advice if you want and so. Everything is included in this app. Very different from the traditional and conservative healthcare insurance companies. You remember what I, talk, what I said at the beginning about disruptive change? As soon as people will know about that, why the hell would you continue with the old one? It's much better, and the experience is much better. So now, what's in it for us? In our companies and in our organization, if we can identify two or three drivers that would change completely our world, and then adapt the recipe to that, you will see that immediately there will be an impact on the performance. Alors, performance, that's not necessarily profit. Huh? Performance, sometimes, that's also impact on the society or whatever, depending on what you've chosen for your organization or for your company. But clearly, focusing your leadership on those drivers will have an impact very quickly on your organization. Whatever sector you are, whatever size you are, small, medium, big, that will have an impact. Does that make sense? Does that ring a bell? 
Any comment or question? Of course, there will be a, there is a book where everything is explained, and so I have a couple with me, if you wish. Um, but first, give me your comments, your reaction on that. Or, or question, huh? I, I have the privilege to open discussion, and uh, I feel we had a very interesting lecture about uh, leadership. And um, I guess uh, leadership is uh, the more important, uh, the more we were looking, uh, um, were, were, were uh, driving in, in a world of uncertainty. When I was a student in economics, uh, I remember that I have been acquainted with the work of Frank Knight, 1921, 103 years ago. Uh, he, he wrote about uh, the distinction about uh, um, a determined uh, environment, uh, a determined an environment where can you put some, uh, some uh, probabilities uh, on, on uh, possible outcomes, and in an uncertain uh, environment. And recently, I, I read a very, very useful distinction that copes very well with uh, your, your ideas. When we have a very determined environment, then you can, we may control it. When we have a risky environment where we can assign probabilities to possible outcomes, then we have a, something that we can manage. But when we have an environment where everything is uncertain, where we have not only known unknowns, but even unknown unknowns, then we have to cope with it. And leadership is very important from what I have uh, concluded from your, from your lecture, is very important exactly for the, the, for, for, for the situation where uncertainty prevails. And that is uh, our world today, and that, that will be our world tomorrow, and the, the, uh, the day after tomorrow, because the compl uh, uncertainty uh, goes in parallel with uh, complexity. And uh, I cannot understand. I cannot find uh, ways w that our, our world will be simpler. I, I, I made it clear in the beginning with uh, my introductory uh, remarks that ev anything that can promise you is that we will have uh, to live in a more complex world. And more complex world means more um, uncertain world. A more uncertain world needs more leadership. And leadership is uh, quite for that reason, very important, and the drivers you have uh, already explained are, are, are pillars for, for, for developing a, a model of leadership that is useful and, uh, and um, not only, only useful, but also co contributing to, to, to the goals of, uh, of, of any organization. Either it is a chamber of commerce, or it is a company, or, or even a nation. No, Thank you very I, much for for I, uh, I, uh, now the discussion. If you have some uh, some uh, questions or some some uh, comments to make, then please do it freely, and uh, Monsieur Faniel will answer these uh, comments and questions. Please, yes. go ahead. Please press the button. So. All in all, how would you describe the future world that we have to live in and work in? With a few words. Hello. Uh, first, if I knew, <laughs> I would be like Obama going into uh, some uh, one one hour speech uh, uh, for hundreds of thousands of euro. If if nobody knows, nobody knows. But we have to be prepared to anything. And to be prepared to anything, that means for me, is to have a key skill for tomorrow. And even the universities are not preparing to that for the moment. But the key skill is, yes, the capability to adapt rapidly. If you have that skill, whatever will happen, you will at least be able to cope, to be resilient, to go into other directions, but that's really key because applying the same recipe that yesterday to problems that we don't even know, that won't work. The recipe will change all the time. And that's why I say, well, when you focus on something, at least you have a direction. 
but you have to be prepared to adapt. And that's a key skill. Be flexible, be adapted. That's, that's the two, two skills for me for tomorrow. And other question or comment, please. Do it really. No one will punish you for, <laughs> <laughs> for anything, Mr. Lafayette. So I would course. like to intervene here and say that uh, I, have a, a, I have a comment uh, regarding your example uh, on uh, the Chinese company that employs AI in order to manage uh, the whole company. Uh, you mentioned AI. AI could mean many things. Yes. Uh, so I assume that uh, they are based uh, mainly on uh, data. It's, yes. uh, it's more data driven. Uh, so uh, since uh, the world that we're living is complex and it's not going to be any other way in the future, uh, do you see uh, the top management skill of the future being uh, uh, some machine? Uh, that could uh, take in all the input and could make uh, uh, decisions uh, very rapidly uh, based uh, on data? This, this, this is a, a very important question. I, I mean, I, I've been uh, participating uh, recently to uh, the HR symposium, symposium of East Africa, and the, the topic of uh, my intervention there was indeed the, the AI and the technology and so, because at the end of the day, this has many implications on many different things. But clearly, the basic, the basic is the big data. And today, because of the technology, it's possible to capture the data in any kind of areas. And so that means that the generative AI can use those data to do whatever we want with those data. Experts say that 80%, 8-0 of the jobs of today will disappear in the next 5 to 10 years because of that because the computer is doing better than what we could do. Let's just take something that everybody knows, ChatGPT. ChatGPT. Ask a question to ChatGPT. Build a report, a market uh, survey on the olive oil in uh, Turkey. Look at what comes up with that. It's, it's frightening because most of the time, you have people doing that for you. You pay them for a couple of months or a couple of weeks to do that. And here it's done in what? 35 seconds, something like that. So how do you manage that? That means you don't need those people anymore. Think to how some companies are analyzing your behavior to make sure that you buy your product, the, their product they know exactly what you are going to react to because they know, because of the past data, because of the past behavior and so, they know exactly how you behave, what you react on. Is it is still a burden to the managers and to ah, yes. the leaders for making decisions. And uh, we cannot, um, for the moment, rely on uh, the abilities of uh, AI to, to provide us with, um, let's say, better predictions of, uh, of the agree? future. There will be not e exact uh, accurate predictions. They are better. Certainly they are better. Sometimes I, feel, I have the feeling that AI will replace uh, analytics or will uh, mm -hmm. do analytics easier for, for those that are employed with this but the burden to take decisions will stay with the humans. Absolutely. Unless, unless you can have, let's say, a, a codifiable objective function for, 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 mm -hmm. uh, for, for AI. That is uh, different. In chess, where you have mm -hmm. a very simple obje objective function, when you can instruct um, uh, the machine how to, how to make evaluation in every situation, then you have... Mm -hmm. A model that is uh, winning. In a situation uh, we, have this, we have commonly described before as uncertain, there are no 
possibility, no, possi no logical possibility to define uh, a, 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 a something that it is uh, quite uh, approx an quite approximation of, of an mm -hmm. objective function. You can have only a, a sense of value. You have, have a feeling of value, but you can never yeah. assign numbers to value. To value. Mm -hmm. Their leadership is very important, I think. So, yes, we, we have we will have uh, as as future managers and future uh, leaders of businesses and organization. We will have uh, to take more decisions, mm -hmm. more wise decisions. That is uh, oh. something we have to learn about it, and that is a skill that has to be developed in in uh, in different places, like starting from uh, from uh, schools and universities. Mm -hmm. uh, even to, to seminars, um, and that, uh, no. well, that's why I think, I think your lecture is, very, is right on the topic, right on and the issue of, 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 uh, of, of the epicenter of this uh, very, very uh, emerging challenge that mm -hmm. poses us uh, the, the um, development of AI. No, I, I, I fully agree, yeah, and, and this is indeed changing uh, dramatically the way you manage your team, uh, you manage the people working with you. Um, and if you don't adapt yourself, you will fail. Let me give you two, two examples. Uh, in our world, I think uh, you are very familiar with this too, but in our world, when we create a workshop on whatever topic, we take an expert, we take what we call an instructional designer, and we put all this together, making some analysis, uh, taking data, taking some uh, discussions with uh, uh, managers, and then we build a workshop. And the workshop will be two days, three days, five days, with uh, nice slides, those kind of things, okay? Today, with some systems, I take this, I put this in the system, and in less than one minute, I have a workshop that I can review in one hour, and it's 95% accurate to transform this into a workshop with an instructor, a trainer. Uh, okay, what do I do with my team of instructional designers? What do I ask them to do? Uh, we were speaking a little bit uh, earlier about the uh, hybrid teams, videos, and so on and so. Today, with AI, you have systems where you have a meeting with plenty of people. You put the system on your meeting, and five minutes after the meeting stops, you have a summary. You can review the summary. It takes you 10 minutes, and it's 99% accurate. Okay, so no need for an executive assistant, no need for, oh, all of this disappears. Do you know the Murphy's law? Tells you something? The, the Moore law, sorry, the Moore law. Yeah, a couple of years ago in uh, Silicon Valley where they were saying, yeah, the chips every year, it will be doubled in terms of capacity and so, voila. Uh, let's imagine a stadium. You know the, the big, uh, the big uh, football stadium. And you imagine that every second there is a drop of water and the drop of water is doubled every second. How long will that take to be floated completely, in your opinion? So every second, so first second, one drop, second, second, two drops, third, uh, Yes, and then eight, and then, voila. How long? Less than an hour. Who say something else? Minutes. 32 seconds. 32 seconds. And you can, you can do the calculation yourself. Huh? Another thing linked to that. You see that this is happening. When do you need to ask people to go out of the stadium before it's flooded and they die in the stadium? 
Yes, but when? Just one second before the full. It's only half, and then it becomes full. Huh? And it's exactly the same in technology. You don't see anything at the beginning. And then at a certain stage, the explanation grows is so big that you cannot cope anymore. And this is what is happening today with technology. We, we have not seen things for a while. And now it's going so fast that every day the changes are disruptive. And that's what is worrying. And that's where, again, leadership is key, because if you cannot adapt, that will be a problem. But of course, uh, we are talking f about a digital world in an analog population. Uh, our minds do not work digitally. And this goes to, um, to the discipline of the organization uh, towards uh, the, the decisions of the leadership. And that is uh, translated to the culture of the organization. Uh, modern organizations, due to the individuality that is being uh, cultivated in the modern world, are not Roman legions to, uh, let's say, obey immediately. In our example of uh, the stadium, you tell them before it's uh, full, when it's half, but the reaction of the people? Mm -hmm. I think nobody has any chance. Yes. Because they don't have the culture. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the main problem in large organizations is how to create the culture that is consistent the, with this constant change and with this disruption that happens all the time again and again. And I think uh, all of the specialists dealing with HR will be facing this problem uh, again and again in the future. Yes, absolutely. And the culture of the organizations is not consistent to the digital world yet. Mm -hmm. Probably two generations after, it may be. But at the moment, I'm, um, I'm skeptical. You know, absolutely. When you think also to what is happening in the universities, the challenge they have, they have to prepare uh, students to things that doesn't exist. <laughs> this is an interesting challenge. I mean, how do you do that? And knowledge, uh, it's not about that. It's about creating, in fact, the skills to be able to cope. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was managing some, uh, some universities for private equity fund in the, from the US, and uh, I was in charge of uh, uh, some universities in Switzerland and uh, in the UK and so. And uh, when we were doing some speeches in front of students being in Asia or, or elsewhere, the question was always about, uh, we were taking uh, Apple, as an example, because Apple, uh, when uh, you take the, the product, the iPad and so, at the end of the day, all of this happened extremely quickly, extremely quickly, a couple of years. So we were saying in that, in that time, oh, look, uh, you are the university and when you go out, uh, it's like uh, using the Apple, it's a new technology, but you've, you didn't know what that was, but that has changed your world, or internet and so. <laughs> We were speaking in years, but now we are speaking in days. That's the difference. So that's where leaders and leadership is even more complex today than ever because it's changing all the time. So uh, I don't want to frighten you, uh, but uh, th this is clearly something that we are all faced, and not only uh, in our organization, but also in, a, in a, not only in companies, but in organization, in NGOs, in structure like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, in, in also in our families, uh, with our kids, and so th this is this is our world today. Uh, one more uh, question uh, yes. uh, regarding uh, the AI tools, uh, as you mentioned, uh, they are based on historical data. Uh, on the other hand, you mentioned that uh, we are already, uh, we're always faced uh, towards change 
so do you see a discrepancy there? For example, could the AI systems that uh, are based on historical, uh, are basing the uh, decisions on historical data, uh, could adapt on a very changing uh, environment? Uh, this is, uh, there are two things here. Yeah. It's indeed the AI based on big data and what they can do with big data, but it's also the technology. And we, we, we have perhaps to split both. I mean, the technological changes are so, so high and so quick that indeed it's very difficult to imagine what is going to happen today. But the research done everywhere is quite impressive. I mean, uh, if we take, for example, the science of the brain, uh, what we are able to do today, and if you don't know, I recommend uh, an author, um, he's a, a journalist in Portugal called Dos Santos, uh, Dos Santos, uh, Jose, uh, Jose Rodriguez Dos Santos, he wrote a couple of books, but it's all, it's fiction, but it's always based on that, on, on, on reality, on scientific data. And one of his book is uh, based on Artificial, artificial intelligence, the technology, and so And he's explaining that today we are able to take what is in your brain in terms of knowledge and to put that on a computer. China in, is investing fortunes to be able to increase your brain capability by chips. The only thing that they cannot do for the moment, but they expect this to happen in between 5 and 15 years is the conscious. But for the rest, today it's the reality. They can link your brain with chips, improving your brain capability or your body capability. Think to what we can now do with people who lost, for whatever reason, the capability to move. Today, just acting on the brain, they are able to move again. Uh, five years ago, that was <laughs> completely un uh, unfortable. So it's AI, yes, but combined to the technology and combined to the data. And the three together, who goes quick. Now, now you mentioned another thing, uh, uh, neurotechno uh, neuroscience. I mean, you, you brought in uh, one more thing, neuroscience. Uh, so, uh, with neuroscience, uh, you can have implants and uh, you can uh, uh, read uh, the brain activity. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, could you predict the future by doing that? I mean, again, we are, uh, if you can read uh, the, the activity of the brain, you are still limited to the activity of the human. Uh, how does AI uh, goes beyond that? I mean, the problems we have, uh, if we think of COVID, for example, it was that it was something completely different than uh, it was before. So uh, that, that was the question I raised before regarding historical data and how we cope with the uh, ever-changing world. So there is a discrepancy there. And I don't think neuroscience could cover that. No, no, and nobody can really predict the future, but that's not, that's not the goal either. I mean, uh, today, uh, I mean, uh, we can take plenty of examples of how they use historical data to predict the behaviors, but it doesn't mean to predict the future. Predicting a behavior, a behavior is not predicting the future, and that's two different things. I mean, a crisis is a, cr a crisis, and then you never know what can happen. I mean, uh, on an island in, uh, close to Denmark, uh, scientists are working on uh, plenty of viruses that are much more stronger than the COVID, and they are very afraid of this to go out of the island. I mean, uh, the, 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 those things uh, can happen. But uh, when we speak about predictive uh, data, thanks to AI and to, um, to the technology, I mean, it can go in all the direction. I mean, there is a study for the moment led in, uh, in Belgium about the analysis of the traffic jam. Today, it's possible to predict a traffic jam 15, 15 minutes before it happens just by analyzing how those stuff happened in the past. So that's how they act on the historical data. Is that predicting the future? No, because an accident could happen. So that's that's different, I would say. 
Από το Ακαδέμιο, ο Προφέσορ Αλεξανδρου Μπούλου. Ευχαριστώ, κ. Πρόεδρε. There are, there are many ethical issues rising from uh, the use of uh, AI. And uh, I think it's up to the, the lawmaker uh, to create new norms about, but also it's up to the companies by self-regulation uh, to have new norms. And of course, we wait uh, these days, nowadays, uh, we wait uh, the new AI Act by European Union, by the European Union. And, uh, but uh, it's very important uh, not to forget that technology must save humanity. Uh, I, I, I cannot agree more. I cannot agree more. Um, the only difficulty that we see into that is that we, most of us, have that opinion. China, no. There are differences uh, in legislation. But I think uh, uh, that even China, uh, they, uh, because it's uh, the, the commerce, the trade, the, and uh, they uh, will be obliged to uh, be uh, the same direction with uh, Europe, maybe, maybe. Maybe. Because Who knows? It's, it's profit, it's, uh, you know. Who, who knows? Have you heard about the social credits in China? You know what that is? Yeah, with uh, the facial and behavior. Uh, but uh, uh, they, are so, they are so far, so far from what we have here for the moment. Yes, but uh, even the USA, USA is very close to our uh, norms now, uh, because uh, it's the e-commerce, e-commerce, and uh, people uh, uh, now are more, are very sensitive about their data. And uh, uh, if, a, if a company uh, respects data, is uh, very good for, for it. Yes. For, this is... Uh, very important. Yes. Thank you. So what would you say, who's a better leader? Somebody who's result driven in terms of profitability, as you mentioned, Ryanair, or somebody who's trying to organize a team to have a better sustainability in the organization, given all these changes? No, we, we all have our opinion on, on, uh, on what is good and what is bad. But um, behind the scene, it's like, uh, uh, a, a judge, a, a cursor. The cursor can be full profit or can be full society. And depending on what you want, you can be in the middle, you can be full profit, you can be full society. And that's a choice that we have to, to take ourselves. Personally, uh, it's very important for me to make sure that for, I manage a company. Uh, one of the key aspect for me is to make sure that the people working with me are extremely happy and that I don't lose them and that they stay with me for years and years and years, even after my retirement. Uh, but that's my uh, choice. It's just a question of choice. You have companies, uh, for them uh, the most important thing is the profit and the profit first. Whatever happens is the profit. And you have companies who want to give back to the society everything. It depends. There is no, there is no judgment. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, we can, we can criticize Ryanair, for example. But at the same time, Ryanair is giving thousands and thousands of jobs. And is, is that good? Is that bad? Yeah, for me, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, allowing people to travel for one euro all around the place and destroying everything is a good thing, but that's a personal opinion. Um, uh, 
uh, we have a lot of questions. I know that we live from the past. I have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, you mentioned before that uh, you asked before uh, how long it would take uh, for a stadium to be flooded uh, with uh, the drop. And you mentioned to the uh, 32 uh, uh, Sonata Fibonacci series. Uh, Let's take this example with uh, the legal issue that uh, Mrs. Uh, Alexander mentioned before. Uh, so flooding in the legal, in legal terms, means uh, how long it would take uh, for a crime to, uh, uh, to overcrowd uh, a country. Uh, in terms of, uh, digital, of the digital world, if we follow the Fibonacci series, uh, are we going to be able to legislate before uh, criminal activity actually uh, explodes and uh, takes over the whole society? So it's a, it's, it's a matter of, then of time. And uh, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, this with uh, Mrs. Alexander on another occasion. Uh, and uh, then I mentioned uh, uh, autonomous legislation. <laughs> so do we need to build uh, a legislative system that would be uh, so very uh, responsive yeah. uh, to uh, legislate in order to be able to, uh, uh, to prevent crime? I, I will give a short answer that you won't like, but uh, I prefer to manage a company nowadays than to be a politician, because... Uh, sorry, but we have not to overstress our audience now, and thank you very much once again for, uh, for this lecture and for very interesting uh, topics you have uh, raised, and uh, of course um, there is a book available there, uh, that is uh, your... Uh, contribution for the for a future elaboration of your ideas um, you are free to I don't know do you sell it or yes it's uh, 20 euros 20 it's euros okay 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 and, and let's ma let's make a, a, s a sort of uh, promotion for uh, two next events of our chamber the first one will be uh, a webinar for introducing uh, uh, people uh, with uh, the uh, criteria of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, that is uh, to be held in, on 22 of April and 24 of April in a webinar in collaboration with ICAP. And then uh, we have uh, a very interesting discussion. We have planned a very interesting discussion in, with, uh, in the frame of beyond on 26 of April, dealing about uh, AI, how to integrate AI in, in an organization, uh, what are the criteria to, to, for, for choosing an application of AI, how do you, uh, how, what are the, <clears throat> um, what is the impact for the organization of uh, the, the, the company, and of course, uh, what uh, additional skills uh, are needed to uh, integrate um, the AI into uh, <clears throat> company's workflow. That's all. Thank you very much.